On my journey from the Isles of Scilly to COP26 in Glasgow, I'm passing through my hometown of London. On this part of my journey, I'll be learning how air pollution is causing both climate change and health impacts on communities here and around the world. So this morning, we're in my hometown of London. I was born and raised here and I love this city. But what many people don't know is that London has a dirty secret. You only need to cycle through London to taste and smell the city's polluted air. In fact, London has illegal levels of air pollution, killing up to 4,000 people a year. So this morning, I'm on my way to go and meet someone who's particularly influential when it comes to cleaning up the city's air. Hey, good to see you, Julian Albert. Good to see you. Good to see you. Good to see you. Hi, everyone. How's it going? Hello. London Mayor Sadiq Khan is all too aware of the problems of air pollution in our capital. Well, if you lived in London uh, in the 1950s, you'd be able to see uh, the air pollution because you see the smog. Unfortunately, now, the air pollution is invisible. It's an invisible killer. And you can't see the nitrogen dioxide, the nitrogen oxide, the particulate matter. But what it's leading to is every year, thousands of premature deaths. Every year, Londoners getting asthma, heart disease, cancer, dementia. Air quality is directly linked with uh, climate change. But instead of it just being an environmental catastrophe, it's a health catastrophe. If you live in the poorest parts of London, your exposure to poor quality air is far greater. Breathing invisible toxins is threatening to all our health. So it's unacceptable that cleaner air is dependent on the postcode lottery of where we live. I want to find out more from the people whose communities are being hit the hardest. I'm Anjali Rama Middleton, I'm 17. My name is Destiny, I'm 18 years old. Hi, I'm Love Sega, I'm 34, and I'm from South East London. South East London. I'm from South East London. I live just off the South Circular and I see all the cars lined up that road and polluting and I see it and I smell it and it's, it's just something that I'm forced to think about all the time. A lot of people will look at it and say, oh, this is just a place where we just drive through when we're going from one part of London to another and you kind of neglect the people who live in Lewisham. Their pollution is there the whole time. I've got loads of like friends and family who have gotten really ill because of it, so whether it be asthma or other illnesses relating to like, the circulatory system, and it, you sort of feel helpless because you're sort of watching your loved ones suffer. In Lucian, there are quite a few primary schools. And then when you start to think, is this affecting the children? I remember that growing up, a large percentage of people in my class had asthma. People would compare their pumps something that no one really thought twice about. And I think that that really has to change. With cars, like, where the fumes are is, like, where, like, a child would be. So height-wise, it's pretty similar. And so they're breathing, more or less, all of that. And that really, really worries me. You only realise it's an issue when something terrible happens. For example, um, the case of El Adu Kissi Debra. Ella Adukisi Debra was a girl. She was nine years old when she died, and she died of an asthma attack. And years later, her family found out that this was related to air pollution in the area. The coroner here has made legal history by ruling for the first time ever that air pollution is what caused the schoolgirl's death. But learning that a girl that I had attended school with, who lived really close to me, next to the same road that I lived next to, really made me think about that air and think about what I was breathing. And I think, for me, it made me learn that air pollution can actually kill people. Cities around the world are suffering from air pollution. And one of the areas with the highest death rate is Southern Asia. I grew up in Mumbai. I've lived here all my life. It's a fast-paced city. It's a city of dreams. It's a city that makes you fall in love. 
It's also a city where dreams come true. My name is Tejas Siddal. I am 33 years old. Tejas is an architect with a passion for sustainability. He's seen many changes in the city over the years. In an ever-expanding city of over 20 million people, the health impacts caused by air pollution are getting worse. In 2020, Mumbai saw an estimated 25,000 deaths attributed to the problem. The air quality in Mumbai is bad, definitely not breathable. I think what has changed over the years in Bombay is it has urbanized real quick. It's the financial hub of the nation right now. So there's a demand for housing. The construction industry is booming because of this, which means the more we build, the more air pollution really happens. Once in a lifetime pandemic has claimed 3.5 million deaths until now while air pollution kills 7 million people every year. That's when it struck so bad that if we are ourselves, say, polluting the city, how are we going to build a better world? With 60% of us expected to live in cities by 2030, unless we take action now, traffic pollution is only going to get worse. Sega is using his music and filmmaking to tell the human stories of communities impacted by air pollution. He wants to show me the issues where he grew up. You don't think about the fact that there's a health crisis here, as there are in many other boroughs. Exactly. It reminds you how invisible it is. I mean, when you look around, if we look like at a window ledge there, and you see how dark that is, you don't even need a meter to see that this is it's an issue, that's what's going in our lungs. Being here, you don't see it, you don't feel it yeah. tangibly, but it's here, it's in our lungs yeah. right now. With air pollution, we are the ones who are suffering on the front line. That's why, in my case, I want to use music and art to platform these voices. Sega's record, Our World, highlights the fight for clean air for those living in southeast London. 44 times 2 inches and 54 foot on top of that As it circles around ourselves Happily chugging and leaving our children's lungs back NO2 means something to me But what does it mean to you or do you not care Because you think you're in an area that's for the well to do When you think about the climate change People are thinking about polar bears yeah. Or they're thinking about sea level rises hitting Bangladesh And you're looking over there because we've been made to look over there Whereas if it's like, no, no, where do you live? Okay, you're living here in the borough of Lewisham. This is where you're living. So there was to introduce, this is our world, and here's the South Circular, which was built through our area to kind of like personalize the South Circular, not as just a destination, but a place where people live. The people who are worst affected by air pollution tend to be POC, people of color, and working class because they tend to live by the busiest roads in the poorest areas. Frustrated by dirty air in their community, Anjali and her friends started Choked Up to campaign for clean air laws in the UK. Choked Up's goal is to create a new Clean Air Act, so we would like legally blinding legislation that actually forces the government to commit to World Health Organization targets and ensure that everyone in the UK is breathing clean air as soon as can possibly be done. The more you get involved, the more you get active, the more you lobby, it could be your council, it could be your mayor, it could be your MP, the more you're gonna see the change we need to see. Our campaign is just under a year old now, and I'm so proud of all of us. Um, I'm just absolutely buzzing. I love talking about Choked Up. Yeah. It's just posing a question. Would you like all of this pollution outside your front door where your kids or where your parents, where your grandparents are? If the answer is no, it's not to shift it to somewhere else. It's to sort of say, well, we're acknowledging it's a problem because we said we don't want it. How do we tackle that problem? We're finally putting air pollution in the conversation. I'm finally being able to advocate for my friends and my family. It has felt life-changing. 
Seeing the kind of impact that we've had has made me, really made me think that anyone can kind of do this work, anyone can have a voice in this movement and can speak out. Coming here to Lewisham, you're seeing firsthand the communities that are on the front lines of this issue, and it's no coincidence that the poorest communities are the ones who are most impacted by this issue. It's a structural issue that requires system change. But the amazing thing about air pollution is that tackling it is a chance to make greener, cleaner cities. It's a chance to make all of our lives better. And finding solutions to a less well-known but deadly pollution problem is what Tejas is doing in India. Tejas discovered that millions of tons of used tires land here every month from around the world, and many are improperly burnt, pumping toxins into the air. The waste tire industry is big business. And sadly, there's a massive trade in backstreet operators dumping out nasty toxins into the local communities. Working with regulated tire recycling factories, Tejas has founded a social enterprise, making use of the waste residue, carbon black, that's collected from these end-of-life tires and locking it into tiles. It's then mixed with the various raw materials that we have, like marble chips, marble powder. We then send that from there to our facility in Morbi, where we work with this 200-year-old craft and the artisans, and we build absolutely any plain pattern or customizable tiles. We then create these various palettes of colors based on a certain pattern that we are going to make. And voila, that's the tile that you get. So each of these colors are different colors right now. And the carbon is going in all of these colors that are made right now. One carbon tile is equal to preventing 30,000 liters of air from being polluted. Tejas is already looking to the future. He wants to find new ways his tiles can help in the fight against climate change. We are also planning to use CO2 and then store it into the tile, which essentially means this carbon, which is present in the solid form and in the gaseous form, would be stored into this tile for decades. As architects, we are all dreamers, right? We dream about a certain kind of a city that we live in. When the city and nature are functionally indistinguishable, that is when we know we have achieved sustainability. Tejas's idea of locking away carbon in building products could make a huge impact. With 90% of us worldwide breathing polluted air, Tackling this issue, regardless of where we live, is a matter of life and death. I've just arrived in Northampton. Um, nice, light little bit of rain. And I'm going to give Tejo a ring in Mumbai to understand some of the incredible solutions he's coming up with to tackle air pollution. Tejo! Hi! How are I'm you? I'm good. I'm good, Jack. How are you? I'm very good, thanks. It's great to be connected. Maybe you could paint me a picture of the future of architecture when it comes to tackling the climate crisis. How important is the role of architects in tackling this issue? Air pollution was one of the major issues that I saw that as an architect, if I'm trying to build something, I'm, I'm, I'm also polluting the world by building. And that's exactly why uh, I started to see that as a different perspective. Can we build carbon negative homes? I think it's not very far. It is a technological challenge. But if you look at it from an architectural perspective, it has a huge scope to store this carbon for decades, just the way how nature does. That gives me hope, because we only have a few years left to tackle this thing. And, you know, architecture and construction is such a huge uh, part of the problem. And it's inspiring to hear that it can be a part of the solution. Thank you for being a part of this project, and I'm looking forward to connecting soon. Thank you, my pleasure, thank you. Great to connect with you. Bye, Bye man. Bye. Aww.
What a guy. What an inspiring dude. How we travel has a lot to answer for when it comes to both climate change and air pollution. On my trip, I've been trying to avoid getting in cars, instead taking less carbon intensive options like bicycles and trains. It's not every day, however, you get offered a chance to ride in a Rolls Royce Phantom. And this one is particularly unique. This is the only electric Rolls Royce in the world at the moment. Is it really? And it's from 1961. It's amazingly smooth, isn't it? It's, it's almost, it's not like being in a car, it's sort of just like... Floating. Yeah, it's like... It's yeah. riding on a bed of air. This company has found a way to convert fossil fuel vehicles to electric. So far, starting with these classic cars, but with big plans to tackle pollution in cities. It just gets your imagination going. You know, if you can turn an old car from the 1960s like that, electric, then what else could we do? I'm here to find out more about this cutting edge approach. And so how does it work? You take the original car and you literally strip out the engine, strip out everything that makes it a fossil fuel vehicle. We take a donor car, which we try to make it so the donor car is not completely pristine, strip it all the way down to the bare frame, and then we do the paint and we slowly build it back up. So we have battery modules that are already available on the market, and we just put them in a package that works for this car. It's a serious labor of love, and it's amazing to see just the amount of work that goes into revamping one of these old vehicles. Right now, it takes us about a year from the point where the car rolls in okay. to where it's rolling out. I'm looking around, there's all these stunning, beautiful vintage cars, and then there's a truck in the corner. What's this thing doing here? Oh, this beauty? This truck is actually the first truck for our Applied Technologies division. Okay. And the whole mentality of how do we reuse, recycle, that's coming from the classic cars, we're trying to apply it to the commercial side. This is going to be our shout out to the world that says, reuse what you have, electrify it, and then at the end of the lifetime, bring it back up to life, keep it on the road, and keep the landfills as empty as possible. Let's be honest, converting classic cars won't end the issue of air pollution. But this approach, if applied to industrial vehicles running through areas where Sega, Destiny and Anjali live, would make a big impact. No more lives should be lost because of the invisible toxic air we breathe. If we can just take one truck off the road in terms of how much it's polluting, one truck at a time, then hundreds later, you're gonna notice a really big difference. Making this episode has definitely been an emotional journey. Um, meeting Destiny and Anjali from Choked Up really brought home the severity of this issue. And I'd like to see political and global leaders step up and really transform cities into places where kids breathe clean air, no matter how wealthy they are. But it's reminded me of the importance of ingenuity and innovation to come up with solutions. The important thing is that they need to be available to everyone. Finally being able to speak up about it and being uplifted with amazing friends. This issue might have started before me, but I'd like it to end with me, um, is what I'm trying to say. It can't be just on the individual to make the change. It has to be change on a systemic level that makes it easier for all of us to do the right thing. Next time, I'll be learning how extreme weather is being made worse by climate change and hearing stories from the people on the front lines of these changes. The lights shut off. And I'll be joined by my twin brother, Finn, to find out how people are coming together to tackle this issue. Hi, Hi Marika. <laughs> that was the same time. <laughs> we don't normally do that.